it, and thereby make real what was antecedently merely potential. The atomization of the extensive continuum is also its temporalization, that is to say, it is the process of the becoming of actuality into what in itself is merely potential. The systematic scheme, in its completeness embracing the actual past and the potential future, is prehended in the positive experience of each actual entity. In this sense, it is Kant's form of intuition, but it is derived from the actual world quad atom, and thus is not, pure, in Kant's sense of that term. It is not productive of the ordered world, but derivative from it. The prehension of this scheme is one more example that actual fact includes in its own constitution, 113 real potentiality which is referent beyond itself. The former example is, appetition. The extensive continuum, section IV, 73. Newton in his description of space and time has confused what is rare potentiality with what is actual fact. He has thereby been led to diverge from the judgment of the vulgar, who conceive those quantities under no other notions but from the relation they bear to sensible objects. T. The philosophy of organism starts by agreeing with the vulgar, except that the term, sensible object, is replaced by, actual entity, so as to free our notions from participation in an epistemological theory as to sense perception. When we further consider how to adjust Newton's other descriptions to the organic theory, the surprising fact emerges that we must identify the atomized quantum of extension correlative to an actual entity, with Newton's absolute place and absolute duration. Newton's proof that motion does not apply to absolute place, which in its nature is immovable, also holds. Thus an actual entity never moves. It is where it is and what it is. In order to emphasize this tilde characteristic by a phrase connecting the notion of actual entity more closely with our ordinary habits of thought, I will also use the term actual occasion in the place of the term actual entity. Thus the actual world is built up of actual occasions, and by the ontological principle whatever things there are in any sense of existence are derived by abstraction from actual occasions. I shall use the term event in the more general sense of a nexus of actual occasions interrelated in some determinate fashion in one extensive quantum. An actual occasion is the limiting type of an event with only one member. It is quite obvious that meanings have to be found for the notions of motion and of moving bodies. For the present, this inquiry must be postponed to a later chapter, 114p, part 4 and also ch. 3 of this part. It is sufficient to say that a molecule in the sense of a moving body, with a history of local change, is not an actual occasion, it must therefore be some kind of nexus of actual occasions. In this sense it is an event, but not an actual occasion. The fundamental meaning of the notion of change is the difference between actual occasions comprised in some determinate event. A further elucidation of the status of the extensive continuum in the organic philosophy is obtained by comparison with Descartes' doctrine of material bodies. It is at once evident that the organic theory is much closer to Descartes' views than to Newton's. On this topic Spinoza is practically a logical systematization of Descartes, purging him of inconsistencies. 
But this attainment of logical coherence is obtained by emphasizing just those elements in Descartes which the philosophy of organism rejects. In this respect, Spinoza performs the same office for Descartes that Hume does for Locke. The philosophy of organism may be conceived as a recurrence to Descartes and to Locke, in respect to just those elements in their philosophies which are usually rejected by reason of their inconsistency with the elements which their successors developed. Thus the 574 Discussions and Applications Low Sophy of organism is pluralistic in contrast with Spinoza's monism, and is a doctrine of experience prehending actualities, in contrast with Hume's sensationalist phenomenalism. First let us recur to Descartes at the stage of thought antecedent to his disastrous classification of substances into two species, bodily substance and mental substance. At the beginning of Meditation I, he writes, For example, there is the fact that I am here, seated by the fire, attired in a dressing gown, having this paper in my hands and other similar matters. And how could I deny that these hands and this body are mine, were it not perhaps that I compare myself to certain per sons, devoid of sense, but they are mad, and I should not 115 be any that less insane were I to follow examples so extravagant. At the same time I must remember that I am a man, and that consequently I am in the habit of sleeping, and in my dreams representing to myself the same things or sometimes even less probable things, than do those who are insane in their waking moments. At the same time we must at least confess that the things which are represented to us in sleep are like painted representations which can only have been formed as the counterparts of something real and true ad similitudinum rerum verarum, and that in this way those general things at least, i.e. eyes, a head, hands, and a whole body, are not imaginary things, but things really existent. And for the same reason, although these general things, to wit, a body, six eyes, a head, hands, and such like, may be imaginary, we are bound at the same time to confess that there are at least some other objects yet more simple and more universal, which are real and true here as see, and of these just in the same way as with certain real colors, all these images of things which dwell in our thoughts, whether true and real or false and fantastic, are formed. To such a class of things pertains corporeal nature in general, and its extension, the figure of extended things, their quantity or magnitude and number, as also the place in which they are, the time which measures their duration, and so on. In meditation too, after a slight recapitulation, he continues, speaking of God, then without doubt I exist also if he deceives me, and let him deceive me as much as he will, he can never cause me to be nothing so long as I think that I am something. So that after having reflected well and carefully examined all things, we must come to the definite conclusion that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true each time that I pronounce it, or that I mentally conceive it. 116. At the end of the quotation from Meditation I, Descartes uses the six Haldane and Ross in close and square brackets phrases appearing in the French version, and not in the Latin. I have compared with the Latin. The extensive continuum. 75 phrase res vera in the same sense as that in which I have used the term, actual. It means, existence, in the fullest sense of that term, beyond which there is no other. 
Descartes, indeed, would ascribe to God, existence, in a generically different sense. In the philosophy of organism, as here developed, God's existence is not generically different from that of other actual entities, except that he is primordial, in a sense to be gradually explained. Descartes does not explicitly frame the definition of actuality in terms of the ontological principle, as given in section IVT of this chapter, that actual occasions form the ground from which all other types of existence are derivative and abstracted, but he practically formulates an equivalent in subject-predicate phraseology, when he writes, for this reason, when we perceive any attribute, we therefore conclude that some existing thing or substance to which it may be attributed, is necessarily present. 7. For Descartes the word, substance, is the equivalent of my phrase, actual occasion. I refrain from the term, substance, for one reason because it suggests the subject predicate notion, and for another reason because Descartes and Locke permit their substances to undergo adventures of changing qualifications, and thereby create difficulties. In the quotation from the second meditation, I am, I exist, is necessarily true each time that I pronounce it, or that I mentally conceive it, T. Descartes adopts the position that an act of experience is the primary type of actual occasion. But in his subsequent developments he assumes that his mental substances endure change. Here he goes beyond his argument. For each time he pronounces, I am, I exist, the actual occasion, which is the ego, is different, and the he, which is common to the two egos as an eternal object or, alternatively, the nexus of successive occasions. Also in the quotation from the first 117J meditation he begins by appealing to an act of experience, I am here, seated by the fire. He then associates this act of experience with his body, these hands and body are mine. He then finally appeals for some final notion of actual entities in the remarkable sentence, and for the same reason, although these general things, to wit, a body eyes, a head, hands, and such like, may be imaginary, we are bound at the same time to confess that there are at least some other objects yet more simple and more universal, which are real and true. And of these, all these images of things which dwell in our thoughts, whether true and real, are false and fantastic, are formed. Notice the peculiarly intimate association with immediate experience which Descartes claims for his body, an association beyond the mere sense perception of the contemporary world, these hands and feet are mine. In the philosophy of organism this immediate association is the recognition of them as distinguishable data whose formal constitutions are immediately felt in the origination of experience. In this function the Principles of Philosophy, Part 1, 52, 7, 76, Discussions and Applications. Animal body does not differ in principle from the rest of the past actual world, but it does differ in an intimacy of association by reason of which its spatial and temporal connections obtain some definition in the experience of the subject. What is vague for the rest of the world has obtained some additional measure of distinctness for the bodily organs. But, in principle, it would be equally true to say, T the actual world is mine. Descartes also asserts that TT objects yet more simple and more universal, which are real and true, are what the T images of things which 
Will T in our thoughts, T informed us. This does not seem to accord with his theory of perception of a later date, stated in his principles, part 4, 196, 197, 198. In the later theory the emphasis is on the judicium, in the sense of inference, and not in the sense of inspectio of real it is objectiva. But it does accord with the organic theory, that the objectifications of other actual occasions form the given data from which an actual loca, 118, scion originates. He has also brought the body into its immediate association with the act of experience. Descartes, with Newton, assumes that the extensive continuum is actual in the full sense of being an actual entity. But he refrains from the additional material bodies which Newton provides. Also in his efforts to guard his representative titties from the fatal gap between mental symbol and actuality symbolized, he practically, in some sentences, expresses the doctrine of objectification here put forward. Thus, hence the idea of the sun will be the sun itself existing in the mind, not indeed formally, as it exists in the sky, but objectively, i.e. in the way in which objects are wont to exist in the mind, and this mode of being is truly much less perfect than that in which things exist outside the mind, but it is not on that account mere nothing, as I have already said point eight both Descartes and Locke, in order to close the gap between idea representing and tactual entity represented, require this doctrine of TTHE sun itself existing in the mind. But though, as in this passage, they at times casually stated in order to push aside the epistemological difficulty, they neither of them live up to these admissions. They relapse into the tacit presupposition of the mind with its private ideas which are in fact qualities without intelligible connection with the entities represented. But if we take the doctrine of objectification seriously, the extensive continuum at once becomes the primary factor in objectification. It provides the general scheme of extensive perspective which is exhibited in all the mutual objectifications by which actual entities prehend each other. Thus in itself, the extensive continuum is a scheme of real potentiality which must find exemplifications in the mutual prehension of all actual entities. It also finds exemplification in each actual entity considered. A reply to objections I. I have already quoted this passage in my science and that modern world, note to ch. I v. The extensive continuum. 77 feet formally. In this sense, actual entities are extensive. 119 J since they arise out of a potentiality for division, which in actual fact is not divided P. Part 4. It is for this reason, as stated above, that the phrase, actual occasion, is used in the place of, actual entity. Descartes, doctrine of the physical world is exhibiting an extensive plenum of actual entities is practically the same as the organic doctrine. The Descartes bodies have to move, and this presupposition introduces new obscurities. It is exactly at this point that Newton provides a clear conception in comparison with that of Descartes. In the organic Doctrine, motion is not attributable to an actual occasion. In the organic theory, I there is only one type of temporal actual entity. Each such actual entity is extensive, 
Indeed, from the standpoint of any one actual entity, he, given, actual world is a nexus of actual entities, transforming the potentiality of the extensive scheme into a plenum of actual occasions, i.v. in this plenum, motion cannot be significantly attributed to any actual occasion, v. the plenum is continuous in respect to the potentiality from which it arises, but each actual entity is atomic, v. the term, actual occasion, is used synonymously with, actual entity, but chiefly when its character of extensiveness has some direct relevance to the discussion, either extensiveness in the form of temporal extensiveness, that is to say, duration, or extensiveness in the form of spatial extension, or in the more complete signification of spatio-temporal extensiveness. Section B. The baseless metaphysical doctrine of indifferentiated endurance is a subordinate derivative from the misapprehension of the proper character of the extensive scheme. In our perception of the contemporary world via presentational immediacy, nexus of actual entities are objectified for the percipient under the perspective of their characters of extensive continuity. In the perception of a contemporary stone, for example, the separate Indy 120 vigility of each actual entity in the nexus constituting the stone is merged into the unity of the extensive plenum, which for Descartes and for common sense, is the stone. The complete objectification is effected by the generic extensive perspective of the stone, specialized into the specific perspective of some sense datum, such as some definite color, for example. Thus the immediate percept assumes the character of the quiet and differentiated end. Durance of the material stone, perceived by means of its quality of color. This basic notion dominates language, and haunts both science and philosophy. Further, by an unfortunate application of the excellent maxim, that our conjectural explanation should always proceed by the utilization of a vera causa, whenever science or philosophy has ventured to extrapolate beyond the limits of the immediate deliverance of direct perception, a satisfactory explanation has always complied with the condition that sub stances with indifferentiated endurance of essential attributes be pro. 78. Discussions and Applications. Thus, and that activity be explained as the occasional modification of their accidental qualities and relations. Thus the imaginations of men are dominated by the quiet extensive stone with its relationships of positions, and its quality of color relationships and qualities which occasionally change. The stone, thus interpreted, guarantees the vera causa, and conjectural explanations in science and philosophy follow its model. Thus in framing cosmological theory, the notion of continuous stuff with permanent attributes, enduring without differentiation, and retaining its self-identity through any stretch of time however small or large, has been fundamental. The stuff undergoes change in respect to accidental qualities and relations, but it is numerically self-identical in its character of one actual entity throughout its accidental adventures. The admission of this fundamental metaphysical concept has wrecked the various systems of pluralistic realism. This metaphysical concept has formed the basis of scientific materialism. For example, when the activities 121 associated with so-called empty space required scientific formulation, 
The scientists of the 19th century produced the materialistic ether as the ultimate substratum whose accidental adventures constituted these activities. But the interpretation of the stone, on which the whole concept is based, has proved to be entirely mistaken. In the first place, from the 17th century onwards the notion of the simple inherence of the color in the stone has had to be given up. This introduces the further difficulty that it is the color which is extended and only inferentially the stone, since now we have had to separate the color from the stone. Secondly, the molecular theory has robbed the stone of its continuity, of its unity, and of its passiveness. The stone is now conceived as a society of separate molecules in violent agitation. But the metaphysical concepts, which had their origin in a mistake about the stone, were now applied to the individual molecules. Each atom was still a stuff which retained its self-identity and its essential attributes in any portion of time however short, and however long provided that it did not perish. The notion of the indifferentiated endurance of substances with essential attributes and with accidental adventurous was still applied. This is the root doctrine of materialism. The substance, thus conceived, is the ultimate actual entity. But this materialistic concept has proved to be as mistaken for the atom as it was for the stone. The atom is only explicable as a society with activities involving rhythms with their definite periods. Again the concept shifted its application. Protons and electrons were conceived as materialistic electric charges whose activities could be construed as locomotive adventures. We are now approaching the limits of any reasonable certainty in our scientific knowledge, but again there is evidence that the concept may be mistaken. The mysterious quanta of energy have made their appearance, derived, as it would seem, from the recesses of protons, or of electrons. Still worse for the concept, these quanta seem to dissolve 1, 2, 2. The extensive continuum, 79 into the vibrations of light. Also the material of the star seems to be wasting itself in the production of the vibrations. Further, the quanta of energy are associated by a simple law with the periodic rhythms which we detect in the molecules. Thus the quanta are, themselves, in their own nature, somehow vibratory, but they emanate from the protons and electrons. Thus there is every reason to believe that rhythmic periods cannot be dissociated from the protonic and electronic entities. The same concept has been applied in other connections where it even more obviously fails. It is said that T-men are rational. This is palpably false. They are only intermittently rational merely liable to rationality. Again the phrase Socrates is mortal, is only another way of saying that T perhaps he will die. The intellect of Socrates is intermittent. He occasionally sleeps and he can be drugged or stunned. The simple notion of an enduring substance sustaining persistent qualities, either essentially or accidentally, expresses a useful abstract for many purposes of life. But whenever we try to use it as a fundamental statement of the nature of things, it proves itself mistaken. It arose from a mistake and has never succeeded in any of its applications. But it has had one success. It has entrenched itself in language, in Aristotelian logic, and in metaphysics. For its employment in language and in logic, there is a stated above a sound pragmatic defense. But in metaphysics the concept is sheer error. 
this error does not consist in the employment of the word T substance, but in the employment of the notion of an actual entity which is characterized by essential qualities and remains numerically one amidst the changes.